Hello, and welcome to this intimate look at a caving couple who left their mark through their dedication and lifelong study of speleology. This variety of visuals has been culled from home movies, field sketchbooks, and photoed memorabilia. My name is Susan Gurney, member of the Society of Women Geographers since 1992 and life member number 9297 of the National Speleological Society. Special thanks to those at the Explorers Club. I offer this presentation to those who left their lives of comfort to seek, to strive, and not to yield. Come closer. Hear some tales of Explorers Club members Russell Gurney and Jean Gurney. Russell Hampton Gurney was a polymath. He was a bottomless pit of scholarship. He justified his investigative style by explaining he was curious. He spread his self-effacing style worldwide, using his tools of one-line humor, well-placed facts, and by giving directions in a step-by-step -step manner. He did so while maintaining a relaxed rapport, even in the most extreme of emergency situations. His even-keeled attitude made him well-respected and liked. He was tall, just about six foot six inches. Although my sister Wendy and I never saw him physically exercising, he was extremely agile. While climbing, chimneying, and maintaining his strength in long, arduous crawls. He always remained soundless and unassuming. Through his life he carried a money clip with Lady Liberty's profile. Known by collectors as the Peace Coin, his silver dollar displayed the year of his birth, 1922. He carried it his entire life. By 1995, the year he died, the bas-relief maiden had all but faded away from his iconic billfolder. Russ Gurney's personal quests maintained a consistent theme that echoed with his motto, gather and share pertinent information, support conservation through commercialization. The seemingly divergent qualities of preservation and exploitation he defended with sound practicality, high tide optimism, and an unshakable belief in exploration for human progress. To him, after thoughtfully opening special areas of caves to visitors, then other parts could be kept pristine. This eco-touristic view was radical. He called it mature cave management. While enlisting others into his pioneering plans or gathering others for a weekend caving trip, he echoed excellence in all endeavors. Some areas of excellence he did not share very often. I was 17 before I learned that he could juggle, and he did so with four bars of hotel soap during a circus-quality impromptu demonstration even my mother was astounded. I did not see him roller skating until my college days. Yes, with hands clasped behind his back in classical form, both backward and forward, crossing one leg over the other, he circumnavigated an oak-floored indoor skating rink with grace. At an international caving conference in Greece, my father drove a chartered field trip bus through the night's darkness on harrowingly twisted switchback roads, down miles of mountainous terrain, after our driver fell ill. Double clutching with steady focus during the driver's intermittent screams of pain on an unknown route, Dad stoically delivered us all safely to the hospital where the driver's ruptured appendix was treated. I tell you here of one of my father's unusual feats of discipline. 
I remember one evening at our home, from his special reading chair, he clapped closed a weighty leather-bound book. It startled me as it resounded with a hollow thud. As I looked up from my homework, he explained he had just completed reading the last entry on the last page of the entire Encyclopedia Britannica, the 11th edition. This written work, with 28 volumes, published between 1910 and 1911, is the set still held with significance by historians, book lovers, and intellectuals. Although unabashed racism pervades the entries from this era, he persevered to read each page using his photographic recall in order to acquire knowledge. All the while he maintained an inordinately strong acceptance of those who held diverse opinions. When my sister and I reminisce, we agree that family experiences always held some type of directed quest and skill-developing focus. My sister and I did not officially complete any full year of school. We were taken out of the classroom to explore a wider world. Until much later in life, we held the false conclusion that family fun meant to get cold and wet and muddy and then wander around underground in spotlighted darkness, waiting to hear someone yell out, It goes! Searching fields for standing stones from Neolithic times, hunting for cave entrances in the dead of winter, counting bats in small passageways, tracing underground water, or making scaled balsa wood models for topographic maps. Early in life, we built hot air balloons, fashioned aluminum field cases at his shop, and even created recipes for protein bars. There was always a focus toward increasing our proficiencies and widening knowledge. Russ Gurney followed his father's advice, and I pass it along here. Read and learn all you can on diverse subjects, not just the area you love most. Without hesitation, be comfortable speaking on any subject for at least five minutes. Listen intently to others and pick up an echo from the depth of their character. Explore this. Russ Gurney loved collecting cave books. Any historic reference to caves got him excited. He cross-referenced his findings, made mental notes, and always had interesting updated exploration news to share. Luray Caverns in Virginia held great fascination, and he enjoyed sharing his manuscript for discovery at Luray Caverns with others. This he did purposefully to include them in an editing process. He involved others and ferried them into mainstream speleology by first giving people a task. From the results of seemingly ordinary requests, he constructed expedition teams. He did so by assessing their attention to details, their abilities as team players, and their capacity to follow as well as lead. All those involved in his projects had to hold an unflinching respect for caves and biota, for the others in the group, and logical thought processing toward each intended goal. His formula of character assessment included my mother's viewpoint about logistical or potential interpersonal conflicts that might restrict the areas of success if a particular candidate was chosen. My parents had the facility to attract like-minded adventurers with varied talents. People grew in numbers, and soon caving groups gathered in caravans of unusual vehicles to go spelunking many times a month. During one annual convention evening, when Russ Gurney was National Speleological Society's president, he was interviewed by a radio station. He may have broken a record that night. I believe so. He imparted fascinating factual historic accountings about caves all night without taking a break. 
It was well remembered that Russ Gurney could draw cave study maps weeks after returning home from underground adventuring. Yes, he possessed an unusually clear memory for factual information and cave-related details. He often painted cave watercolors in a tiny hardbacked sketchbook. He used an aluminum 35mm film canister for water and a Winsor Newton vest pocket watercolor set he picked up in England. He sketched designs for construction with high proficiency, showing complex two-point perspective. He would separately draw important elements as they would be seen from all different sides. His sketches showed a steady hand and a keen attention to detail. When working in countries where they didn't speak the same language, his advanced drawing skills bridged gaps. And meanwhile, Russ made drawings that he submitted to the Barbados government of his ideas for new Barbados postage stamps. It wasn't until we were home again uh, and that we received this envelope in the mail with four of Russ's drawings on stamps. Russell Gurney and Jean Gurney received high honors. Here are some of their achievements. Russ led the Floyd Collins Crystal Cave Expedition in 1954. In 1956, the Gurneys led their first international expedition to Venezuela. In 1958, their first mini-expedition to Puerto Rico to explore caves. In 1964, they received grants for the first Rio Camoy expedition. The Gurneys carried the Explorers Club flag number 178 on several caving expeditions to Guatemala and Puerto Rico. Russ Gurney was president of the National Speleological Society from 1961 to 1963 and served on the National Speleological Society's foundation for years. He was president of the International Speleological Union and presided at the Congress in Ljubljana. Jean was one of the first female members of the Explorers Club and as editor-in-chief produced four Explorers Club quarterly journals. She was inducted as a member of the Society of Women Geographers in 1967. In 1990, Jean received the Outstanding Achievement Award from the Society of Women Geographers. She served on the National Speleological Foundation for decades. It was here tireless work that coordinated the internal organizations of active grottos across the United States. Working with authorities, Jean Gurney and team ferried a bill through Congress to protect cave resources on federal lands known as the Federal Cave Resources Protection Act of 1988. Russ Gurney, president of the Explorers Club from 1973 to 1975, was presented with the Sweeney Medal for his dedication to speleology. He sat on the board of governors of the club. As chairman of the annual dinner committee from the late 1960s to the 1970s, he enjoyed creating unusual events. These annual dinners were landmark black tie occasions held in the Waldorf Astoria in New York. His delight was designing the surprise-filled evenings, inviting unusual guests of honor, and assembling the menu for the exotic hors d'oeuvres. One year, the annual dinner introduced a caver who arrived by rappelling in full tuxedo from the Grand Ballroom's balcony to the stage. For a dinner called Lighter Than Air in the 1970s, our family worked together to construct a mylar dirigible that Dad designed from historic references. It was remote controlled. Slowly, it flew above the heads of those eating in the Waldorf's Grand Ballroom. I remember the surprise when Russ Gurney featured a theme from the deepest to the highest and had Tristan Jones bringing his beloved fold-down boat to the stage that was used on his solo trip from the Red Sea to Lake Titicaca in Peru. With confirmation of human tenacity over thousands of miles, hauling his rugged boat and sailing on uncharted rivers, even for jaded Yacht Club New Yorkers, his three-year trek was certainly a highlight. Quietly, for most of Tristan's salty and embellishment-filled career, my father remained his benevolent patron. When Tristan could not get funding, it was my father's joy to help this iconoclastic sailor and talented writer to continue in his daring escapades. 
Russ Gurney stayed Tristan's ally through his serious and sometimes capricious solo expeditions. After Tristan lost his leg to gangrene at sea, Dad championed him through a remarkable recovery and was later gratified by how Tristan helped other young sailors with disabilities. Although extremely perceptive of the depth of work of others, my father was not quick to flatter. He was visibly proud of the mega-cavers who worked through pain and great losses to set depth records for cave diving expeditions underground. He loved the tenacity of the photographers who elevated cave photography to a high art within an environment of total darkness. His pleasure was to learn about the arduous studies people did to bring credence through recordable evidence to antiquated indications of how caves were used through history. He loved to hear about new technology and even the most minute of scientific findings. In short, he fashioned his life around the world of caves and explorers. Jean wrote many inquiry letters to magazines and alerted outdoors equipment companies about the emergence of caving as a sport. In her diplomatic manner, she explained that cavers will need specialized gear. She suggested they sell such things as knee pads, helmets, and waterproof backpack bags. The letters from magazines and equipment companies proved that my folks were decades ahead of the mainstream interests. We became used to the steady sound of her typewriter. It was impressive to see the piles of letters she wrote to keep local chapters of the National Speleological Society, show cave owners, and forthcoming expedition details organized. How amazing, even after a full day of typing cave-related material, she would often retire to the piano to play classical, ragtime, gospel, or contemporary music. Sometimes she would motion to Dad in his reading chair. Urgently, she would wave her arm, beckoning him to walk to her side at the piano stool. She would then point to the sheet music while still playing with her other hand. He would subtly nod and, without warm-up, give a flawlessly tenor solo performance every time. Then he would return to his reading. Before expeditions, our family would rally with Mom's facility to speak Spanish and Dad's uncanny ability to enlist effective people. At the field house in Puerto Rico, my sister and I learned many diverse skills. Here is advice Jean Gurney gave to me. Practice increasing your discipline and notice when any part of your body is feeling tension. Release this. Learn why you feel distressed. Adapt and continue. Peck and Olsinger reported a noteworthy scientific advancement at the Rio Kamoi Cave. Peck and Holsinger collected a little white eyeless crustacean six millimeters long. It was found to be a new genus and species. It was later named in my parents' honor, Alawakalia gurnii. After Russ Gurney passed away, Jean continued her involvement with caving and was fully engaged in cave-related activities to her last day in June 2018, at the age of 92.